Hey everybody, it's Terry D. Lab Electronics. Behind me, I have an all-time classic, a National 173 shortwave receiver. This one is in beautiful condition, comes from the original owner. I've made some improvements to it, and I want to share that with you. But first, we've got to set the mood, right? And how do we do that at D-Lab Electronics? Yeah, fill up that hammered ham glass. Got the golden screwdriver, got a cool radio. Let's see what it's about. So in this video, I'm gonna show you the maintenance that I performed to this vintage receiver and show you two ways that you can enhance the performance of your vintage receiver by using some cool D-Lab modules. Okay, here is lowdown on the 173 receiver. I acquired this from the original owner's estate. So there is the cabinet shell, which I've removed. Came with the original manual and matching speaker. I obviously have already recapped the radio. So the new filter cap is back there. I've checked tubes, pulled out all the wax caps underneath, etc. But the big problem was, is the tuning dials were so dark that you could barely read the print on them. Now you can see that's not the case anymore. I actually bought a replacement set from Radio Days. They make reproductions of these dials. And you put them in there, and man, does she look good. But the installation is quite the challenge. Let me show you what's required. So on these dials, let's talk about the failure modes. One is that they darken over time to the point where they're not even legible. But the most common failure mode is they get damaged. So this is a phenolic material, very thin. And behind the tuning knobs, there's a little pulley that pinches just the edge of those and as you turn you see them rotate but they are moving a gear mechanism behind the scenes which makes your tuning capacitors operate okay so you can see this one's nice and smooth but what happens is the lubricant in these little gear drive mechanisms and behind the tuning knobs gets old and gummed up and you start developing a lot of friction here and of course these discs can't handle a lot of torque so I have these receivers come in here and the edges are chipped where this little pulley back here is just chipping away at it because there's too much drag on the discs so if you elect to change out these discs there's a couple things that you need to take care of before you put this receiver back in operation Alright, so as I discussed earlier, behind these knobs, there is a little pinch type of a pulley where this edge rides, and that gives you the drive of the disc. What happens when you have one of these discs that have been damaged, and there's little pieces of phenolic that broke off, sometimes they're stuck in that little pinch area of the pulley. So if you try to reinsert a new dial, and it hits that piece, it will actually chip your new dials. So make sure that's been cleaned out. There's also a bearing behind this knob. You need to remove that, clean it, re-lube, and make sure that the flywheel action is free to turn, which this one is. Now behind the dial, you have this gear assembly. Okay, There is a little snap ring here. You pop that out, and you can pull this gear forward. I take lacquer thinner, clean the shaft, I clean the inside of this bearing and re-lube everything and freeze it right back up. Now if you take a close look, remember I brought up that the hubs were originally pop riveted? Well I had to use little 440 screws with lock washers and then I took my Dremel tool and I cut off that shaft to where it was flush with the back of the nut. Reason for that, as you turn the dial, you need clearance of that nut behind this little stopper plate. That plate is there for this action 
to stop the dials from going too far. But you still need to clear the nuts. In this case, there is plenty of room, but over on the band spread, I had to actually mill that little piece of brass to clear the nuts. It was about a sixteenth of an inch too long. I'll show you that side. All right, this is the band spread dial. Same apparatus, same gearing that you need to clean and lube. And there's that stopper I was telling you about. But as you turn this one, you can see those nuts are really close to that brass plate. Now, I don't know why this one had an interference fit, whereas the other one I didn't have to do anything to. But that's just something to keep in mind. Unless you can find some really thin 440 screws, you're probably going to have the same situation come up. And then after I installed these, I put a little drop of adhesive on the nuts so that they don't come off in the future. Same gear drive, and this one drives the band spread capacitor. It's all working very nice, nice and smooth. So here is a very important tech tip if you decide to change these dials on your radio. All right, so you're going to pull off the old dials, you're going to clean and lube all those gear assemblies, get everything back together. But then when you reinstall your dials, you need to make sure those caps are in the right position or your calibration is going to be totally off. Now luckily, on this main tuning dial, you simply set the mechanical stops to where they stop at each end of the dial. Okay, And you observe the main tuning cap and you will see that it is reaching both ends of its travel. So this one is pretty easy to set back where it was. But when it comes to this band spread, they had what they called a set mark, okay? And this cap for the band spread, as you turn it, it will go 360 degrees. She'll just go either fully closed this way or you can actually spin it the opposite direction and also achieve fully meshing of the caps. So what happens here is if you get that 180 degrees out, it'll throw your main tuning dial way off. They have a thing here called the set mark. okay, And that is where you put the band spread dial when you want your main dial to be calibrated. So if you take a look, here is the position of your band spread capacitor when you're at the set position. Alright, so this receiver is just working beautifully, but what the risk is at this point, since I'm running it out of the cabinet, if somebody were to come by and hit one of these dials, it's doomsday. So before I give you guys a full demonstration of this radio, I need to get it back in the cabinet. Alright, before I put her back in the cabinet, I'll give you a nice scan of this chassis. Just unbelievable construction. They sure were focused on quality back then. This thing's already 70 years old. And she'll go another 70 for sure. From you, or I've got the radio reassembled and we're on 80 meter AM. Atmospheric distortion, you know, it kind of muddies audio. I mean, you're plenty loud. It just got, it gets muddy because of the distortion. Then it, you know, it fades back, to, fades away, and everything gets back to normal. All right. Uh, the only thing I said was don't, don't sell, don't take your four or six and a half because you'll have to give it away. So let's check out my one megahertz crystal calibrator for the National 173. It is a plug-in module. It goes on the back of the receiver. Let me take you around and show you what it's about. All right, to install the crystal calibrator in the National, you need a way to turn it on and off. So this position used to be for a phono jack, for like a record player input, okay, which would never be used. I found a switch that fits in that position with no drilling required. So this is the on-off switch for the calibrator. 
Then around the back, we have the plug-in module. So there it is, a little XCU-1M, and that is plugged into the accessory socket on the back of the receiver. So as I stated, the module simply plugs into the accessory socket. There are some very minor changes to enable this function on the National 173 receiver. All right, here's how the calibrator works with the National 173 receiver. You can either calibrate your main dial to be accurate for general coverage receive, or you can calibrate the band spread dial for, let's say, the 40 meter ham band. Let's start with the main tuning dial. So what you do is you're going to pick a frequency. In this case, I'm going to say I want 10 megahertz to be accurate. Turn on the calibrator. And now you're going to move the band spread until you see the S meter respond. There it is. You see how it peaks? Now 10 megahertz is accurate. If I were to turn this off, you should hear WWB. So there it is, right on the money. We have now calibrated the main tuning dial. If you do not touch the band spread dial, this analog dial will be fairly accurate throughout its range. Now, let's calibrate the ham band for 40 meter reception. All right, now let's use the calibrator to set the band spread dial to be accurate for the 40 meter ham band. So back in the day when they designed this receiver, since it didn't have a calibrator, they put index marks on the dial. So see that 40 in the circle? They wanted you to put your pointer at 40 and then use your band spread for the 40 meter band. So you got 7.0 to 7.3. And you can hear there is ham activity, okay? But if you wanted that to be accurate, the calibrator will help you out. So what we're going to do, we're going to leave that at that dot, okay? We're going to put this at 7 megahertz. Turn on the calibrator. Once again, we find the signal. Turn off the calibrator. And now this dial is accurate. Let's see if you can find some AMers. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I had that trouble too with the B's and V's and uh, the uh, kind of run together there. So as before, to maintain the accuracy on your band spread dial, you do not want to interrupt the main dial. So, okay, Dirt. Uh, uh, you're a little on the late side here. You can keep about an S7, but. Uh, yeah, I'm copying you there. That's why I had a little trouble. I had my noise here. Is so there is the beauty of the crystal calibrator. All right, now let me show you a really slick standby system that you can add to your National 173 receiver. For the standby module, you have to install a chassis mount RCA jack that provides the mute function. You plug in your RCA plug which goes to your Dow key contacts, shorting the center to chassis, mutes the receiver. All right, there is the standby module mounted inside of the National 173 receiver. It has a relay on here. It's a double pull, double throw. One half is tied into the standby switch circuitry, which turns on and off the B+. The other half shorts the antenna terminal to ground when you're in transmit mode to stop RF from getting into the receiver. 
there is the RCA jack that I showed you on the back which keys the module. Pretty easy installation. Glue it, hook up a couple wires, and you have a really nice standby system. All right, here is how the new standby system works in the National 173 receiver. We're still listening to those 40 meter guys. You can take your send receive switch, that mutes it, and you're receiving, okay? So what National had you do to integrate that function into your TR switch is there's a plug on the back of the receiver. You had to hook up two wires and bring that up to the external contacts on the dial key. Problem is, is there's about 300 volts DC on those wires because it's actually turning on and off the high voltage in the radio. It's kind of a shock hazard. My system reduces that down to about 16 volts DC. So let's check out the mute function. I'll get to it. Everything's good. Everything's still good. Yeah. So you're receiving. You're going to key your mic. Dial key toggles. And you mute. Unkey. Key it up. So, really nice. A very safe way of muting your National 173 receiver. So if you'd like one of these 1 megahertz crystal calibrators for your National receiver or a standby module, I have them for the National 173 and many other makes of the vintage tube receivers. Just drop me a line. 73s from N6TLU.